Joe. Let's see. Where? That is that. What is that? That's her. But it's Where? like that other one that you have. Yeah, no, I know. She's right here. She's with us. That's like right on your lens. And then look. <laughs> oh, a red orb. Everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. We have a great presentation for you about orbs and apparitions. Um, we have been working very hard at putting this uh, particular webinar together, and we're very excited to share it with you because we have lots of photos that we're going to show you from our personal collection. Uh, the photos that you just saw were from Country House, uh, but a lot of the other ones we'll be showing you tonight are from our personal archives and you're going to see orbs, apparitions, and examples of ectoplasm or plasmoids. So thank you for joining us. If you have not been here before, I'll give you a little bit uh, of an idea about who we are. My name is Carrie Ann Flanagan Broski, and I am the author of eight books. I'm currently working on my ninth book, uh, Haunted Long Island Mysteries, which will be out next fall. I'm primarily a nonfiction writer. Um, I'm best known for the ghosts of Long Island, historic haunts of Long Island, historic crimes of Long Island. And this past fall, um, a, an author, Rachel Kempster Barry, adapted um, a middle grade children's book um, after my historic haunts of Long Island. So that's available uh, out there now. And usually we're on book tour in the fall, but because of the pandemic, we decided to start doing webinars and we've had um, a lot of people interested in them. So we hope that you enjoy what we're going to tell you about tonight. So Joe, a little bit about you. Sure, well, um, in 1980, I had the pleasure of moving into a haunted house, not knowing it was a haunted house at the time. And that got me interested in the paranormal uh, after I got out, graduated from Adelphi University. Um, Fast forward several years, I was going to a Halloween event hosted by Carrie Ann Flanagan Brosky, and it was in Huntington and met her and we had a connection, seemed like we both had something we could contribute to her uh, book project, she being a historian and me being a ghostbuster. So mm -hmm. um, started doing the work on the first book in 2006 and how many books has it been now, Carrie Ann? Um, that you and I have worked together mm -hmm. on? Four, uh, four, five. Yeah, I think about one, Just two, maybe four, four? Yeah. yeah, but yeah. you've done like what, nine or 10 books? Yeah, working on the ninth. My other books um, are, um, I've written one co-authored an Italian cookbook with Mr. Sausage in Huntington, My Other Love is Food. And I've also written one novel called The Metal, which is based on a true story having to do with Padre Pio, the saint who bore the stigmata. So if you're interested in any of those books, you can check out my website at carrieannflanaganbroski.com. Or if you forget that big long name or how to spell it, you could just go to ghostsoflongisland.com and you'll get to everything there too. So uh, people ask us about orbs all the time, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. We're going to try to save the questions for uh, the end of the evening. So first, I'd like to start talking about what orbs are. They're actually a light anomaly that are now believed to be the spirits of uh, people from the other side, and that they have reached uh, like an, an ability almost to cross the veil. Now, these spirits can be your own loved ones. They could be angels, saints. They could be people from history. A lot of what Joe and I do when we're out doing our investigations for the books are mm -hmm. historical um, in nature. So we'll get uh, spirits from maybe the Revolutionary War. So this has been an amazing phenomenon that has um, been occurring. And... Um, they're spiritual based. We're, we believe that there is communication that is possible between uh, these orbs. Now they can be round, but they can also be like laser beams, um, different shapes. 
and they can move um, over time. And each orb, like a person, um, is, is individual because they are a person. So they can be, uh, they're mainly translucent, but sometimes the ones that are very, very bright are not translucent. And um, they can have all types of colors in them. A lot of them are, are speckled, uh, almost like a stippling type of a thing. Uh, they can have rings throughout them. Um, some of them have a dark hole. I'm going to show you that's a skeletal type orb. I have an example of that uh, to show that's you That's a really tonight. interesting one. I never yeah, that one I just before. learned about. And when, because uh, I'll tell you a little bit about a book that I had been uh, reading on orbs, but I had, when I was going through pictures to see what I wanted to show everyone tonight, I actually found one. I didn't know, Joe, that I had one of these pictures with this black hole in it. But the other interesting thing is that sometimes orbs can actually have a face in them. Um, I captured uh, an image. I was at a party somewhere one time, wasn't at a haunted location. Uh, that's the other thing to note that orbs can be anywhere. It's mm -hmm. not in a location that's, that's presumably right. haunted. So, but this particular orb was actually behind my sister-in-law on the wall. And when I took a closer look, it had a dog's face in it. So sometimes the orbs can have human faces or even animal faces and they can appear uh, really anywhere. It's not just any particular location. For me, I have, uh, I really spent a lot of time back in 2006 and 2008 studying orbs and photographing them. And I realized that there was one in particular that followed me wherever I went. And I could be in my backyard. I could be in Montauk, Florida, North Carolina. It didn't matter where I, I was. This one particular orb was always with me. So part of me thinks that that was um, the orb of my father who had passed away uh, almost 16 years ago now. So it is a comforting, um, it's a comforting thing to see these orbs. Yeah, and Carrie Ann, I just like to wet everyone's whistle for um, later when we show some of the orb photos. I have a video that will that will offer proof that the orbs, as Carrion's talking about, that the, the spirits and the orbs are actually manifested together. In other words, they're the same. They, the spirits create the orbs. Because you know, you see an orb, and Carrion will cover many questions about orbs that people have. But this uh, we have I have this video that was done in the field during one of my um, seances where I spoke to a spirit. And then the spirit creates an orb and flies away from me. So that will that will be a nice way to cap everything. So, okay, yes, anyway, definitely. go ahead, carry on. Um, so when did orbs first appear? It was re really around the 1990s with the onset of digital cameras. And it's very interesting because everything is energy-based, even when we've had our discussions about EVPs and what, happens, what we believe happens is that the spirits are able to manipulate the energy and things like recorders and cameras. And there's something in particular with uh, the digital camera. I mean, I have captured orbs on a film camera because the original Ghosts of Long Island books were done with a, a Nikon um, F3, which is a film-based camera. But they became more and more prevalent with the onset of these digital cameras around the 90s. And what's interesting is uh, my degree is in photography, so I know the difference between you know orbs and dust particles. I'll get into that in a moment. But I shoot with two different cameras now. I shoot with a Nikon D80, which is a professional camera, battery pack, whole nine yards, and a Nikon Cool Picks, which, which some of you may have at home, and. Oddly enough, I get more orb photos with these small cool pics than I do with the big camera. And you may ask, well, why is that? The spirits, like a person, have an easier time manipulating the smaller camera than they do this big, heavy, professional camera. So it's interesting that I've noticed uh, these different things. Um, now, as far as uh, what I've mentioned about um, like the orbs and photography, that's my degree is actually in photography. I went to Long Island University at CW Post and studied under um, famous photographer, Arthur Leipzig. So I know the difference between a dust particle and an orb. A dust particle will stay in every single frame until you clean the lens. And it is not translucent, so you can't see through it. 
and it doesn't have these speckled effects and these different things that we see uh, with the orbs. Um, the orbs, it's amazing. I could take a picture and they could be three orbs, let's say in, a, in an image, and then take another shot and there would be maybe one orb. And then in the third shot, no orbs at all. So that is definitely not a, uh, is definitely not a, a dust particle. And um, again, it's something with the flash. The flash seems to trigger them. Now, I told you about the books I was reading. I don't know if you could see, I think things are, are is this backwards, Joe? <laughs> no, it's good. No, it it's reads right. Okay. Yeah. All yeah, right. I, I, these two books I really recommend, okay, if you want to really learn more about orbs. And this first one called The Orb Project, uh, I'll probably butcher his name. I feel bad. It's Mikhail uh, Ledwith and Klaus Heinemann. And now I'll give you a little bit of idea about their background. Um, Mikhail Ledwith was a systematic th uh, theology professor and a member of the International Theological Commission. Klaus Heinemann holds a PhD in experimental physics and was a science researcher for NASA and UCLA. And he was also a research professor at Stanford University. He had spent years um, on mending the rift between science and spirituality. And in this book, Ledworth discusses what he calls um, skeletals, which is what I mentioned before, a type of incomplete orb that may not have yet fully manifested itself into frequency that the camera can capture. So again, I didn't even know myself what that was until I read about it in his book. And then I happened to discover one in my picture. I, I didn't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. um, so why do they why do they form? They want to be able to communicate with us. And if you believe that they are family members, then if you go back and look at some of your photographs from past events, when we all used to be able to get together with one another, you might see this light anomaly behind. And I remember having a conversation with my mother-in-law one day and she says, well, I've never seen it on any of my pictures. And I said, well, that's because you probably weren't looking. As for me, being a trained photographer, when I take a photograph, I'm looking at everything. I'm looking what's behind the person. That's why a lot of times when people take photographs, it looks like there's a lampshade on their head because those are people inexperienced. They're not looking at what the whole picture is. So a lot of people, if they're looking at a group of like four or five people, will be looking at the people. They're not looking at what's on the back wall. So that's where the orbs form. The orbs, um, they want to be part of the celebration. So if your Uncle Harry uh, was the life of the party on every New Year's Eve and then he passed away and then you take a group shot with your family members and there's an orb behind it, chances are that was Uncle Harry paying a visit to you on New Year's Eve. So it should be very comforting. I remember when um, my older son was doing a... Uh, it was a stepping up ceremony, I guess, from uh, pre-K to kindergarten. And his cl whole class, um, I don't know, it must have been at least 70 kids, were performing songs on a stage in the basement of a church. And my mother-in-law was sitting next to me and she took a photograph of the group of kids singing. And she was shocked to find out that there were orbs all above their heads. And it was remarkable. She says, why are there so many? And I said, well, you're fortunate that you are still alive and that you're here um, to be able to see your grandchild. But a lot of these kids don't have grandparents because they've passed on. So take it as a good sign when you see orbs. It is something that is um, very comforting and they just want to be a part of where we are. Sometimes in your own house, they could be people that lived in your house prior as I mentioned, Joe and I do a lot with uh, historical places and mm. we get orbs, right? Um, at bakeries. Great things. At, at bakeries, yes. That's, uh, we're going to talk about that uh, coming up next, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So that's because, um, as I mentioned earlier, orbs can move. Now, I'm primarily doing still photography. So my orbs are, you know, circular and still. But I have captured some okay. orbs that you could actually see them in motion and they look like a, like a tube almost and you could see the rounded edge. But one place in particular that Joe and I have been to for, um, I think it was in historic haunts of Long Island, mm -hmm. was Fiorella Dolce Bakery in Huntington. Unbelievable bakery, we're friends with the chef. 
Uh, a these, delicious experience. Karen. Yes, it, it is. But the ghosts like to hang out there too. Mm -hmm. And he actually had showed us videos, multiple videos of orbs flying around his kitchen. Incredible. And this is a spotless, clean kitchen. Okay. There's no windows or anything like that or anything flying around. And he has captured these orbs um, on his surveillance camera at night when no one is there. The other interesting thing that he captured, which we're still trying to figure out, it looks like, um, you know, like those hedge, the old fashioned hedge trimmers, uh, or there's a shark, like it's, I think it's called a sawtooth shark, but that has all just ridges going across. There's something like that that he has captured that you see flying around. And then there's this laser beam type thing. So orbs can definitely move around. And sometimes I can't, but Joe, uh, being a medium, he has at times seen orbs uh, with the naked eye. Correct? Actually, I want to tell you that um, when I was writing the final summary for the outline tonight, mm -hmm. this is like an hour or so ago, as I was writing about typing word orbs, an orb flew by me. Oh, it did just, Yeah, just <laughs> like. Well, one time we were doing a Zoom call. We had a meeting, the two yeah. of us. And I saw one fly around. Well, there's always orbs. That's one oh, thing yeah. I've gotten photographs of, of Joe with orbs on him. There was one, remember the orb on your nose? I still, after all these years, was, I still yeah, have not was, seen that orb picture. <laughs> she, she's that, hiding after that was That was a funny one. So, um, you know, if you want to tell a little bit about how orbs are created, sure. you know, in different atmospheric conditions. Yeah, well, no, I do, um, one of my specialties besides EVPs um, is uh, spirit photography. And Carrie Ann and I often try to decide, you know, what's the best situation to create an apparition or an orb, any kind of light anomaly. And it is really an atmospheric thing. So two things have to happen. You have to have the right environmental situation and you have to have a trigger. The trigger basically is, why is the orb appearing? As Carrie Ann was talking about, the spirit wants to communicate. The second thing though, is the atmospheric part of it. And what I mean by that is, let's say, a spirit wants to create an orb. Well, you have to have the right lighting conditions, the right atmosphere, the right humidity in the air. Uh, you might have a rain, maybe it's drizzling out and the rain acts like a mirror and gives the spirit the opportunity to bounce light off of, of the air. Not that this, the raindrops are creating the orb because that's not an orb, but you have to have the right atmospheric condition. You have to be in the right place, the right time to see it. Um, and um, again, the spirit has to have some reason, some reason to want to show you the orb. So if you don't have the sender of the orb and you don't have the right atmospheric conditions, you won't, you won't see anything. Um, especially if, if you don't believe in it, you're skeptical, or maybe as Carrie Ann mentioned, you go back to your old photographs, you'll see orbs in a lot of these photographs that are hovering over, even in the, you know, the old print photographs, the, the, um, you know, not the digital photographs. I've actually seen them too in Newsday. The you have newspaper. In, in on Newsday, occasion, yeah, if on, they on newsprint. get a photograph of uh, like an accident that happened at night mm -hmm. and you see an orb in the photograph. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You get to, what happens mm -hmm. is once the spirits know that you're looking for them, you tend to see more of them. They're probably always there. You just notice them more. But again, you'll start if you're doing this and you're, you're working, you want to see the orbs, eventually you start seeing them real time with your eyes. Um, and they're very fast. They kind of zip around. Um, now, are, what is the meaning of orbs? Well, they are messages from spirits. They are signs. They are signposts. Um, they could be a manifestations of the spirit's energy, their ectoplasm, their, um, their aura. Um, the main thing, though, is that each orb occurrence. Each time you see an orb, it's a very personal experience. We're going to get into colors, uh, talk about colors here in a moment, but um, orbs mean different things to different people. For example, with Carrie Ann, she believes that her father, she took care of her father when he was ill for many years, right? And um, you always believe he's with you. And so the orb for him is a signpost. It's a marker that he's there lets her know it's a comforting feeling. In other cases, uh, the orb is spirit. Maybe during a you're doing a reading with somebody as a medium and uh, the spirit is giving you a sign, maybe a color or 
a face or something, or just appearing at a certain time to let you know that they're there. So here I'm writing about orbs tonight and I see orb, an orb zipping by. It's like, Joe, we, we know you're writing this topic. Just like when Carrie Ann uh, is writing a chapter about William Sidney Mount in her last book and uh, William Sidney Mount is like standing over her shoulder and spirit saying, no, 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 I want this book cover. I want, <laughs> so it's the same thing. It's just, in, uh, spirits can't write a post-it note. So it's another way for them to mess around with energy in our atmosphere, inanimate objects and atmospheric conditions to be able to give us a message. So they're a lot of fun. And I'd like to talk a little bit about orb uh, colors. And um, I'm gonna put that chart up that we had, all right? So this is a chart of, um, hey, can you all see that? Carrie Ann, is that yep. up there? Okay. Looks good. Yeah, so um, <laughs> what do orb colors mean? Well, I was looking at this list and I'm saying, yeah, this is a nice list. Um, it talks a lot about spirit, spiritual energy, talks about um, angelic beings, talks about different shades of color, like red, deep red, et cetera. Personally, I think you, if you go on the web, you'll see a hundred different orb charts about a hundred with a hundred different meanings, just like people interpret dream meanings. What you should take away from orbs, a color of an orb is it's a very personal experience. What I mean by that is this, let's say you see an orb that's green. Does that mean green with envy? Does that mean green with money? Are you expecting a promotion at your job? Does that mean um, jealousy, you know, envy? Does it mean um, green means go? Maybe you have a big decision in your life and you decide, should I go? And then, you know, you're someone who passed that you're in love with, a spouse, a grandfather that you're very close to, comes around and gives you a green signal, meaning like a traffic light, go ahead, go with this, take, take, the, take the path and uh, see where it leads you. So orb colors are really cool. So you could be in this chart here, um, this is more of an energy, spiritual energy chart. Uh, so you get into the very white or silver or light colors, um, you're getting into more high energy. Again, it says here, red means stress or restlessness or high energy. I mean, red can mean love, you know? When I do readings, um, a lot of what I get are symbols. So I'll tell the spirits, you know, if, if you want to show me love, show me red or show me a valentine. So I look for a valentine in my third eye. And that's uh, orbs are the same way. If you had a pet that passed, as Carrie Ann mentioned, you may see a, an orb with a face of a dog in it. And it said, hey, that was my, that was Rover, you know? Yeah. So, But it's interesting because you can get a lot of colors and we've gotten uh, photographs that have you know, a bunch of white ones and then a couple of color ones here and there. So yeah. uh, and we'll show you those too. Yeah, definitely. We, you're really going to enjoy these these orb pictures. Carrie Ann, I have to tell you, I I went with mostly your orb pictures because they they really are amazing. Yeah, I mean, they, they, it was really, hard for me. To, and, and that was, you know, I cut back. I had he, given Joe originally like 40, 40 pictures. pictures. <laughs> I'm telling you, these orbs are, yeah. I'm, I'm not an yeah. orb guy, all right? I'm not an orb guy. I get a few orb pictures here and there, but she is the, we're going to call her the orb girl of Huntington. I mean, uh, so, well, let's talk a little bit about the orbs that, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, I saw a dark orb or a gray orb or a black orb. Is, is that evil? No, not at all. Uh, a black or gray orb could mean a couple things. Could mean there's not enough light to see the orb. Maybe the spirit wanted to, to be a make a big impression on you so, so tonight i saw a dark gray or they just want it was easier because the room it was a the color of the um wall was light so it was easier for me to see the dark orb than if it was a light orb or a blue orb but also it could be grieving it could be sadness when i do a reading and someone passed and they're very there's there's no closure and the person died tragically sometimes i see an orb that's gray or black or and that's really just a grieving spirit. Okay, so orb colors, again, the thing to take away from them is their personal experience. They have to be on cue to what you're expecting and they have to be meaningful to you. So if you're expecting a sign of love from a grandparent who passed and you feel they're around and you see a red orb, 
I would interpret that as love. Okay. Now, um, some people say, can I see an orb with my own eyes? Sure. Yeah, you, you will, if you keep looking for orbs, eventually you'll start, as Carrie Ann, right? You started yeah. seeing orbs too. On occasion, um, yeah. On occasion. So, um, so I think, yeah. yeah it's a ahead. positive thing though. It's I a mean, positive thing. as Joe said, because people say, oh, well, does that mean that my loved one's not, you know, on the other side? No, it doesn't. As I mentioned earlier, it's a way that they are able to cross the veil, you know, that things are changing in our world and that communication is more possible. So it doesn't mean that they're not where they're supposed to be. They most definitely are. Um, but this is just a way that they're finding to be able to communicate with us. Now, there's something else I had mentioned earlier called ectoplasm. And I know it sounds like something out of Ghostbusters, uh, but it's also called, I'll read you a definition here. It's another type of spiritual uh, phenomenon. It's a term used in spiritualism to denote a substance or spiritual energy exteriorized by physical mediums. It was coined in 1894 by psychical researcher Charles Ryart. Now, the author of the Orb book I told you about, Letwith, he refers to them as plasmoids. Um, and I have some examples of this. It's very strange because I could be taking pictures of orbs and then all of a sudden you see this, uh, you know, this foggy mist on a day that's not foggy or misty. And um, so I'm excited to show you some examples of that. Hey, Carrie, I just want to say, I, I've got to go through my work, my photos too, because I think I've seen that too and I didn't know what yeah. that was. So that's interesting. It's good work on your part. Mm -hmm. And um, then, then there's the apparitions and they are not as common as one would think is not as common as what the movies make them out that everything's an apparition because they actually take a lot of energy to form an apparition compared to forming an orb. Now there are times that it could be the actual person. Okay. For instance, the country house, we bring this up all the time in Stony Brook, people have seen the apparition of Annette Williamson, who is an active spirit in the house. But then other times it could be residual energy of that person that is seen, um, at that moment of time. And it's it's just one of those things where you have to be in the right place at the right time. So again, atmospheric conditions come into this. Um, there's different ways that they can form these images. Sometimes they do something called matrixing that Joe has had a lot of experience where they will take certain uh, leaves from a tree. I think we have like an example of that when we show the Quaker mm -hmm. um, and that the images that are already there are manipulated somewhat to form what looks like an apparition. So, uh, but like I said, they're not as common, but we, we do have some examples that we're going to show you when we get to the slide presentation. Yeah, and um, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I, again, am more of an audio person. So most of my stuff recently has been with either doing the mediumship, the readings, the intuition, or doing the EVPs. Sometimes I don't even bring my, my good camera anymore. I just bring my little, like you said, just a down and dirty camera works this as well for stuff. But in the beginning, when I first met Carrie Ann, she really screwed me up. I mean, I had a nice quiet evening at home. And um, in 2006, which just was after I met her and we started working on a book, all heck broke loose in my room. My room became spook central out in the Hamptons. Uh, I was seeing apparitions form on the wall. Um, I had clouds of ectoplasm with spirits flying in and out of it, floating above my bed at three o'clock in the morning and I wasn't drinking or smoking. Um, one of my first apparitions where I actually saw it manifest, it was very beautiful, was in Lambertville. At the old, I think it was the Lambertville house, which has been renovated to now a nice bed and breakfast. But um, they had a room called the ghost room. It was room 203, the second floor. And uh, I went there on two or three occasions, one being Halloween Eve, and, or All Souls Eve. And I was there and I slept in that room. And of course, I was always visited by the same ghost, um, a ghost of a little boy that would manifest at the outside of the door. And I would feel his presence standing outside the door as if he was you know, waiting to see if she'd come in or not. And then I would see this mist uh, just 
develop on the door frame until this beautiful emerald green mist that was like this apparition for me. And then I would hear the boy run down the hall, get her patter of feet, and I would hear this, the screen door slam. Of course, that was on the second floor. If that was really a boy running down the hall and running out that back door, he'd fall two stories to the ground because that was the back of the building. I don't think, think there was a fire, a fire escape there anymore. So that was my one experience. Then I got this um, first apparition ever was a disembodied head, which I got at the dining room, at the Logan Inn, in the, in the dining room mirror. That's a very haunted place in Logan. Very haunted, one of the most yeah. haunted places. In, I think yeah, I think that place is like 300 years old, right? Yeah. So maybe more now. <clears throat> so that was really interesting. But um, yeah, orbs, um, apparitions are very interesting. And we're going to show you some really uh really cool uh, photos tonight. So a couple All right, I think we're just about ready. We do have questions so. coming in and I do see them. So don't think I'm ignoring your questions. And there's some good ones in there yeah. and a story too. So we'll get to all of that after the presentation. Now, or, uh, Joe is gonna put up uh, first the orb photos that I've taken um, during a period, time period. It was primarily 2006 uh, through 2007, but I do have some in Massachusetts taken 2011 and some other time periods. Um, and it was just a time in my life where I was really focusing a lot on studying them and photographing them. So the first set we're going to show you uh, were taken 2006 in my backyard. My backyard is much nicer looking now. It's, there was like nothing in the backyard at the time. So excuse how that looks, but um, we're going to show, oh, this is one of Joe's. I, that's, I, not, that's not my backyard. <laughs> no, no, that's that, that, no, no. Uh, not that's less, uh, Orient uh, Church, uh, right? Joe? It's Orient Church. Okay. Yeah, it's just a dramatic photo for the start. Oh, for the and start. And that's not yeah. an orb. That's actually the moon. Oh, and okay. I, actually, I actually photoshopped that moon there, just saying so, you know, that really is a fake image. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's the only fake image we have in this. There you go. Okay. All right. Let's see if I can get this thing to move. Um, okay. And then, all right. So these are the back. All right. So you're going right. to narrate this yep. area? Okay, so now this one, you could see multiple orbs in it. You see this bright one here. Do you see my arrow, Joe, or you don't pick that up if I- I don't it? see it, no, okay. you, that right. one there. Okay, yeah, so there's that one. And then here's the big one, but look, do you see the different colors? That yeah, one's a bluish beautiful. one. And you can see how um, a lot of them are translucent. And it was one of those things that I was photographing and then I had one or two orbs and then all of a sudden, all of these orbs appeared. This is the back of your house. Yeah. This is really amazing. And now, now we have all different trees and that's cool. Really, fence. Look, I love so it. Look at red, now, white, but... carry on, red, white, and blue. I Did know. You... It must have been around July 4th. That's right. Now, here you see like these similar orbs that um, have that speckled look to them. And again, this one of them is very much, I, I can't really tell you know, on the screen now, but when I blow it up, there's one that's very similar to these that I think is my dad because it's similar in a lot of other photographs mm -hmm. I've taken elsewhere. But these are just amazing. And these were taken on the same night. Mm -hmm. So you can see how they move. Now look at this one. I love this picture because you see one in motion on the left and then you see this multicolored speckled one and then you still see smaller ones that are not as defined the red on the side that's someone's from someone's house so um that's not anything but you see many orbs in uh this picture that are not as bright as the other one so this is now at a friend's house in silo city north carolina around the same time period and again see so you see that same orb that looked like the one in my backyard that might be your father. Yeah, and this this one I love too. Uh, oh, so you see, so this beautiful. is very different. I mean, look, look at how, how look bright, how bright they. Yeah, are. and that one I think has a ring uh, in it, um, and it's just amazing how they have these different sizes. And this is a really dark area of North Carolina, so all the light that you see on that tree is from my flash. Um, so there was nothing else going on and it was in the middle of the summer. All right, so uh, here's that orb. Look at how low that is. And it's just so bright. I love that one. That was again at my house. And this is back in um, 
I don't know, this, was this, I guess this must have been North Carolina, this one. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And again, you see- uh, Quite a crowd, quite a yeah. party there. Yeah, I know. It's an, it's an orb fest. <laughs> All oh, right, now here's an example. Plaza. Okay, no, actually, yeah. I was wrong. That last one was from my house. Okay. Uh, because then this was the second one I took, and you could see, and this was a still night. There was nothing at all going on. There was no wind. There was no misty rain, nothing. That's and amazing. this started to form over the orbs. And then in the next shot, it was clear. That's great. All right, in Montauk now, here's another... Uh, Look at this with this green orb was amazing. That is, now these were shot again with your um, Coolpix camera? Yes, or? yeah, the, most of these were shot with the, I think well, maybe, probably all of them with the, the Nikon Coolpix. This one's interesting here. It has sort of an aperture here or something. Yeah, there. yeah, that's what I'm saying. You could see, that could be one of those skeletal ones there right. too. That's what I'm thinking. Forming, that's not totally formed. Okay, now this was in Montauk um, at night on the beach, and this is another form. I'm looking up at the dunes, and you just see tons of orbs plus this ectoplasm. Again, when I took another shot after this, it was like a clear night sky. It's just amazing how many. Yeah, and you know, that's kind of what I had over in my room that was hovering over me that night yeah. when I woke up. I actually put my hand up into this thing and it was icy cold, which right. goes to the spirits taking the energy out of the air. Right. That was really amazing. Yeah. Boy, you had a lot of company. That must be the Montauk project. <laughs> well, Montauk is a very spiritual place. It is. Yeah, and it is. we have another one um, coming up in this. Okay. Wow. This I yeah. love. Now, Joe has been here. He was not with me when we captured, when I captured this. This is at the Fort Hill Cemetery, which is next door to the Montauk Manor, which is on the cover of the I wonder if that's, the, is that, you think that's the chief? It, it could Oops. be, but um, I love, and then you see some more at the top, the upper right-hand corner. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very dark cemetery, okay? And the Indians had their camp there, and this is actually looking towards um, the manor, I believe. But when I captured this orb, I was just blown away. It's it's just spectacular. And then yeah, again, you see the ones at the top right hand corner that are yeah, coming also, into the frame. I just want to say too, it seems like Carrie Ann with these orbs, the spirits are almost like they're stepping up to the plate and they're like, yeah. okay, this is me. Yeah. Because what we seem yeah. to have is it's not random. I mean, sometimes you get like just a bunch of them, like you saw that other picture. But a lot of times you get one that kind of comes forward and the others are all in the back. Yeah, the, I know. It's interesting. I know. Like, so this is also like this Fort one, Hill. See? Yeah, this is a new one. Um, we have this bluish one at the top and then you have all these small, these baby orbs all over the place. And again, this was a completely clear night. There was no rain. It was the summertime. So there was there not snow particles or anything like that. And it's just, uh, it's amazing when you capture things like this. Okay, so this is, oh, we're coming up to that black hole orb, that skeletal orb. All right, so this was from the front of my house looking, of course, at my neighbors. And you see this bright one, then you see there's a double orb, one on top of the other. And then the one that's at the peak of the house, you could see that black hole in it, okay? and I believe that's what he was saying led with in the book that that is called what he calls a skeletal um, orb that's not fully formed yet. Yeah, but here, this is- Yeah, that's a double also. one there, isn't double that? One. Yeah. yeah, but for the audience, see, this is how you can tell it's a real orb because it is truly light, it's not dust because you can see the tree branch through it. So, yep. so that's, exactly. that's a key thing. A lot of people say a dust is opaque. You don't right. see through dust or, or raindrops or anything. All right, here's Look another example wow. of uh, ectoplasm. That's incredible. That's the beauty. That looks almost like, like the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, I know. And and in the next shot, nothing. I mean, black. Oh, there's oh, the here's, hole. here's the one with the hole. That was a definite one. Yeah. I didn't even realize that I had that. So I was, after I did the research on that it, I was happy a, to, to have seen it in my yeah. own images. Yeah, that is a beautiful yeah. example. Really, really great. Yeah. All right, this one is interesting because this was the one and only time I captured a red orb. 
But oh, see that other green. one again? That other yeah. one with the color. That's your, that's your is, father. Yeah, that's what I think. It's the same, yeah, yeah. The same, same type of orb. Speckled but that red bluish, one, red green. Uh, that red one was really interesting to get. And then you see some other ones um, throughout this image and the tree branch on the right. And then there's another one on the towards the left. Was your father big on Christmas? Was he? Was he? Um, no. I really. No, but like you said, it could mean, you know, love too. Love, yeah. You I'm know, just so. interesting though. It, I get a sense that the one behind him is is a female, so maybe mm -hmm. someone else mm -hmm. um, that is you know coming through. Maybe a grand, maybe his his mother, mm -hmm. or you know what I mean? It's, yeah. So. That's beautiful, really beautiful. Oh, look at this. I know, here's, here's another one. Um, and this was in North Carolina, it just appeared. Gorgeous, just appeared. really gorgeous. Yeah. Now this is great. Um, I go up to Lenox, Massachusetts every year and it's also very historical, um, known to have a lot of ghosts. And this was not a snowstorm. There was no snow, <laughs> I swear to you. I know you say, oh, well, it was snow on the ground, it was snowing. This was one of those crystal clear nights where it's so cold and nothing moves. And I took this picture and that place that you see there um, is a haunted location. And mm -hmm. I was shocked at just the amount of orbs that were there. Again, this is not snow, trust me. No, and they're, they're all varied and they're yeah. clear. Um, and you could see the sky is clear. Yeah, and you, you could know. see too, if you look on the window below the big orb, you could see another orb and you could see right through it. Yeah, right here, you could see the window yeah. frame. Beautiful. And this is really great, I love this. This yeah. is the entrance to uh, Edith Wharton's house. That's not it her is. house, her house is way bigger. This was like a caretaker's cottage or something, but you could see in these were black and white photographs. Um, actually, no, they weren't. It was just yeah, this, dark this out. Color, yeah. yeah. Um, but you could see there's a ring around this one. And I took this out the car window, the passenger window, and I almost had a heart attack because I was like, whoa, the orb is right here. Yeah, it's right, right on, at the it's, car. It's right was, with you. Yeah. yeah, it was right there. So that, that was amazing. They knew you were coming, so they baked you a cake, as they said. There, there you go. And yeah. then in the next shot, um, I, you know, we were back a little bit from the gate and again, just these orbs, but look at how the one on the tree trunk, you could see again, right through that, mm -hmm. no snow. I know there's snow on the ground, but this mm -hmm. is not a snow event at no. all. Those orbs are too big for snowflakes anyway. Yeah. And snowflakes would act as mirrors. They would reflect back. Right. Like and they, would, they wouldn't be different sizes no. like this. And the air, you know, I could just tell there's no dust in the air. The air is right. completely clear on a cold night like that. You, you're not going to have any yeah. dust particles flying yeah. up. That's great. Yeah. So those are some of mine. Now we're going to get into some of Joe's. I just have a couple here. Uh, like I said, I was I was bowled over by Carrion's beautiful orbs, the colors and everything, just amazing. So this is Yarmouth Port. Um, this was at uh, a client's home in Cape Cod. Um, and it's really beautiful up there and all the homes are big and they have all these big sloping properties and there, the water's there and the, you know, just the bay and everything. You can go walk to the beach and everything. And this is like Orb Central here. Yeah, uh, this, this is great. Yeah, this place is called, actually this was a bed and breakfast that she ran at one time, it's called Five Trees. Um, and I guess there were a lot of uh, people at the trees, <laughs> <It's so close. laughs> must have been all the people that lived there or something. But it was an old house, and uh, right. there was a cottage too. But this was just at night. It was like a summer night, like August or something. I had some experiences there at this place as well. But uh, okay, and then we have our famous orb girl. Well, yes, we had a presentation. Um, the music, however, is uh, we can't include the music because it was licensed. So um, we had to dispel with the music tonight. But um, um, this is the country house, and the up, if you look at the upper left here, you could see there's the orb. Now, you want to talk a little bit about Annette and what we're going to be seeing here? 
uh, well, this house, we're actually going to be doing another webinar and right. just specifically to on Country too. House, but this is located in Stony Brook. Um, it was in the first Ghosts of Long Island book, and it was also a repeat story and historic haunts of Long Island. And this is an orb that Joe had captured, uh, who we believe is uh, Annette Williamson, who was murdered in the house during the Revolutionary War. And there was an artist that had done a painting. She was driving by very early, like five in the morning when she saw this image of a girl hovering over the house. And she decided to make a painting of it. This is the painting. And when Joe uh, blew up that orb that he got the night that we were uh, working there together for the story, it almost matched identical to the girl with the blonde hair and the wreath of flowers around her head. If you see that comparison shot, <laughs> so you see they, you see they inserted the color purple here, which is the purple flowers, and then the locks. You can see the locks of hair here, and then this gold color, this energy. And the eyes. The eyes here. Mm -hmm. I, I had a thing where I had sketched this, where this, you could see the pupil here and the eye, but that's it's a little bit of a stretch. This is really, really zoomed in very close. So right. I want to just back off here. Um, so this this is again the trees that little orb you saw at the top of the country house in the trees that's what this one is now look at this here Karen I don't know if you ever notice this you see yeah, this it looks like a face is in there yeah you see there's a body forming here and oh this looks like an right. arm and a hand here so this yeah, might be one of those orbs right and that's sort of like what we discussed about matrixing right using the objects to make a formation right. Okay, and then and this is a this is a fun one. Carrie Ann has she has the lock on on the colors and the beautiful orbs. Me, I get these orbs that just enjoy taking being in the photo. So let me just set this up for you. So we were at the Orient Church, and there's this fellow Caesar. He's really into orbs. Um, he does presentations or he that's his favorite topic. And Caesar pointed his camera in the corner of the church in the back of the church auditorium hoping he could pick something up. And I was behind Caesar taking a picture of him taking a picture of hopefully an orb. And guess what the spirits did? They put an orb right in front wow, of Caesar. Amazing. Now, I don't know if he actually got that picture. <laughs> right, but, but you did, did right? <laughs> yeah. And that's happened a couple of times where I, uh, David once, uh, one of our colleagues, David, we were in a uh, Calvert in, in um, you know, haunted home. And um, he had his little camera. He was taking a picture of the stairway and I took a picture of him and in his, in his camera LCD you know, a monitor there, you could see an image of a woman leaning over as if to put something in front of the camera so David could photograph it. So um, that's a great one. Now I want to show you the my favorite orb. Now this was captured by Monica, Monica Thomas, who's a friend of mine, and she's a colleague. Um, we had an opportunity to go to a private home on North Street uh, in, in Manorville. And it was only two of us made it to this event. It was, we had a blizzard and it was really awful. I couldn't believe it. She came all the way from, I think, Massapequa Park or something. And I had to come from Hampton Bays, but uh, it was a terrible drive. Anyway, we got there and everyone else had been there at this gathering. Well, on the road, <coughs> as she's approaching the home, there's the snow. Look at this angel that appears. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, this is a great photo. It looks like one of those angels, like those crystal angels you buy at Christmas to put on the manger or something. And down here, you couldn't see any houses along the road, but here, they illuminated this, whatever this house was, to make it look like a crutch, like a manger. Oh, yeah. That's See? So you have it's all lit up all the way down. The road leads there. We have all these spirits. This is, again, snow, but all these kind of orby snowflakes coming at us, driving at us. And then you have this angel hovering over the manger. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? So those are the orb pictures. And um, so... And I have a video. So remember we were talking about, um, I just have to cue it up. Okay. 
So remember we were talking about <clears throat> how um, spirits, you know, we make the connection between the orb being a, something created by a spirit or a representative spirit or a sign, a sign that the spirit is there. So here is direct proof of that connection. All right, so the setup for this is that I'm in Calverton, I'm in a private home. We're doing one of my seance group reading things. And uh, one of my members in the group, she was taking some pictures to see just if anything would happen. And I suddenly felt the spirit of this girl, uh, Elizabeth, I think it was. She's a little girl that haunts this house. And she was off to my left side. And I, I felt her there and I felt like I needed to admonish her to sort of like not do any, because right before that, the woman who owns the house was complaining that there was so much phenomena she was losing sleep. So I was kind of telling Elizabeth the spirit, if it was Elizabeth's spirit, to kind of calm down, let, you know, you've got to listen to the adults when they tell you, don't make ruckus at night, don't wake people up, don't turn lights on and stuff like that. But I felt her right to my left side. So all of a sudden, so my colleague is panning with the camera in the room and all of a sudden, right after I say, you have to listen, you see this frustrated spirit leaves my arm and like a butterfly, which is supposed to be a feminine signal. So it would be a woman. They want me to know it's a, it's a female spirit because it's like this butterfly fl fluttering away. It wasn't like a macho energy that I had. And this butterfly orb flutters away from my left arm. Okay, yeah, all right, let me get that. I have to cue that up. And I think we have it right here. Okay, it's a short video, but here we go. Can you see that, Carrie Ann? Yes. Okay. Comfortable here in this house. That needs to right. stop. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thanks, David. That was amazing. We've been, oh, I'm getting, somebody's grabbing my arm now. See, I just said that now somebody's grabbing my arm. You have to listen. <gasps> what? What do you see? Oh my God. What? I, I, I. What, you're not going to believe what I just captured. So that, <gasps> there it is right there. You see it flutter away? <laughs> and then, so I guess, oh my God. I guess I got I got this spirit upset and she decided what, just to book it out of there. I just I see, There's I another see. orb that appears also. Okay. Uh, let me, well, when you said here. you felt something by you, I, I went over by you yeah, and then yeah, I yeah. caught yeah, something. Yeah, do you see oh my life God, flash? I have to shut it off. To, and right. I went over by watch. you yeah, and then yeah, I yeah. caught see something. See the life flash oh behind God, me? But I have to shut it off to, and stop videoing. That's all right. Don't you? Yeah, so and I would, that's such an amazing one. I know you've shared that with me multiple times, Joe. And it's always one of my favorites to say. It's, yeah, it's it remarkable makes, the communication. It, it, it makes your point, though, that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to be able to pick up on it, but it makes the point that the spirit was directly involved yeah. with that orb. So. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Um, now we want to show you a couple of apparitions. We don't have many, but the ones that we have, I think, are very great. Um, this is one that I captured at the Ketchum Inn Foundation, uh, at yeah, the Ketchum Inn, yeah, one I by the Ketchum Inn Foundation. Uh, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about <clears throat> that the house represents several time periods with the earliest, uh, the original settlement cottage was built circa 1693. It had been many things over the years, including a tavern, a hotel, a restaurant, and a home. And sometime during the 1800s said that a young girl was helping to prepare the family feast and was plucking uh, the feathers off of a chicken and a duck. And the feathers were falling to the floor and she started playing around with them. And uh, she accidentally, uh, her dress caught on fire and she, unfortunately she burned to death. And many people have felt the presence of a young girl in the house and has seen different things. Um, so we were in an upstairs room and I was photographing, there was no ceiling to this room, by the way. So we were sort of stuck up against the wall on this plank thing. Right. And I had taken a couple of photographs in that room. There wasn't anything to photograph because it was being in the process of being restored. And in one image and only one image that I capture this girl, uh, Joe, if you could maybe, since I have no control over the, um, arrow here but you can see um her 
like her Victorian outfit with the big sleeves, her hand is resting on something. Now this is a second floor window, by the way. Okay, so there was no one there. You could see she has blonde hair, maybe a bow above her head there um, and her face. And um, this was probably my most famous of my apparitions that I captured for my assignments for the book. And I most definitely believe that this is the little girl. And the other pictures I had taken of this window did not have her in it. Yeah, it's a really nice one. I, I like the hand. And you can see, actually, you know, in this photo, you can actually see the material. Like yeah, the I know. It's amazing. It. And, yeah. the, and the sleeve, it, it really is incredible. And keep in mind uh, that, you know, these, these images are not going to be perfect. They're not going to be, you know, like right. crystal clear because they're apparition. They're using light energy. They're messing with the camera uh, photography to get to make this this quick snapshot of a a light anomaly. So like right. an orb, it's it's going to do the best it can. Yes. And then in this next one, uh, Joe was not with me um, when I went to Winfield Hall in Glen Cove. It was built in 1917 Look for five place. and oh my God, five, I know it's is... amazing place for five and 10 um, dime store uh, mogul um, Frank W. Woolworth. Now, this place, there was no one here except the caretaker at the time, which is, this is a story for another day. But I took this picture and this is what appeared in the book. And I had been in the house with the gentleman. And um, when I was looking, I said, what is that in the bottom left hand window? It looks like a person sitting in the window looking out. And I had been in this whole building with the owner. Here. and. Um, all the way on the on the left, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, if you point it right into the window, do you see it, Joe? Now you're in the your arrow is going the wrong way to the left. I think it's frozen. All right. Well, let's get to the next slide, and then you can yeah. see a bit the close up of of yeah, someone okay. sitting. And and I believe that this could be the ghost. Uh, it's covered by my. Yeah, I believe this could be the ghost of Edna Woolworth, which was one of Frank Woolworth's daughter who committed yeah, suicide. And there's conflicting stories whether or not she had died um, at Winfield, but there was no way that there was anyone in the house at the time that I was there. So that was one that I had captured um, also for the Ghost of Long Island book. And then this next one, Joe, um, I'll let you explain. This is one of Joe's uh, early photographs for Ghosts of Long Island. It's beautiful. That's yeah. Cool. I think we lost you for a second, Joe. Well, it looks like these are this one's out. This one, this one in first because this is a low pain in New Pennsylvania. Ah, yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. You're frozen. Do you have too many things open, Joe? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, but it's, you sound like you're going <laughs> off to the veil. <laughs> okay. I had to All say right. it. See the screen? Yeah, maybe. Um, do you see, you know, can I can you... go into the answer, right? Um, now, can you see the sides of, hang on, let me. Yeah, uh, I think you have too many things switch. open. Joe. <laughs> okay, you should be coming back. Okay, soon. there we go. All right. So it says here we see Logan yeah. in disembodied head. So we lost. Uh, what happened to Quaker? Here we are. Um, okay. So can you see Logan in? We. I just see it. Just says Logan in. Yeah. In. Okay. Yeah. I put that one first because that was actually the first experience, the first apparition oh, okay. I had. So this is the disembodied head. I just switched uh, internet connection. So oh, okay. I'm back. Um, so I don't know if you could see it. It is, let's see this, see the guy right here, his head, see the mustache, the nose. He's got this, this cap or his hair. It's a little hard to see. Yeah. But it's zoomed in. But uh, when you see it from the full size photo, it's a little right. easier to see. A lot of these images, what happens is they, um, they are matrixed. So you have to see them as, at a certain size because sometimes the details just get washed out. And I probably over edited this photo. This is when I first saw it. the original photo is actually a, 
a print photo. It's mm -hmm. it's it's not it's not a, a digital. So okay. the, the original I'd have to rescan the original. Okay, this is the Quaker Cemetery. So um, we went there um, with my group, and we're looking. I took something said take a picture over here of the woods. Because was this with your group or was this with me? No, this is with my group. Okay. And um, I looked over here and I said, that's weird the way the, um, the tree is bending around, like almost like a locket, like a portal. So I zoomed in and this is what we saw. Civil War soldier, ma matrixed by the leaves and the trees and the branches. You can see he's holding a hat on his side. You can see his white beard, he has a hat. You can see his gun belt. You can see his dark trousers here. No, I love that picture. You I like love that, that one? Yeah, that, that was the first uh, apparition we had gotten when I started working with Joe. He had shown me this and we put it in the book. And that was our first apparition that we had put for Ghosts of Long Island. Yeah, and look at this. Look how look how the, the um, trees bend around with the flowers. It's almost like one of those old vignettes, like, you know, those lockets. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's a great picture. Okay. So I have my girl in the window also. <laughs> now I did I did edit this. Um, it was a very, very grainy photo. So here's the original photo. You don't even see it here, but this is Deep Wells in St. James. I had found this years after we actually investigated the place. This window here, you see this little mm -hmm. image here? Right. Oh my gosh, you never yeah. showed me this one, Joe. No, no, I didn't find this until, now again, I did a lot of wow. cleaning up on it, but yeah. Um, so that is the girl in the window reading a book. She, it looks like she's sitting there uh, on the steps or something. And uh, again, wow, you would never see it looking at this thing. But when I took this, something said there's something here. I took this, I cropped it, I straightened it out since it's sideways. And then I started to see this this form and I just took away some of the, the graininess and the noise and that's what I ended up with. Wow, that's so amazing. It looks like she's got a big textbook there. Yeah. Studying for something. So wow, that's a yeah. great one. Yeah, I'll show you that when when one day when you uh, we get together. Right. Yeah. So that's uh I think that's all the um pictures and videos yeah. we have. I would tonight. like to start getting to uh some questions, questions. here. Yeah. Uh, Thank you everybody okay, for we have Marissa watching. saying the picture of the girl was amazing. Uh, Joe's girl in the window. Okay, so now we have a bunch of questions. So I'm going to get to sure. everyone here. Okay, <clears throat> so first we have two questions here from Jean. Uh, why do these spirits stay in this realm? Why don't they go and be free? So as we had mentioned earlier, they are free. They are on the other side. I mean, my belief is heaven. They're just simply crossing the veil, the same way as how the spirits, if you listen to our past webinars on EVPs, how they can leave voices on the recorder. Um, they are where they're supposed to be. It's for our sake, it's for our comfort, mm -hmm. so that we know that they're still with us on our own journey. Also from Jean, um, I told my mother when she died that she was free from obligation to us to go and have fun. And I hope her life there is better than this was. Most definitely. I am telling you um, that when you pass on, if you were a good person on the earth, then you're not suffering anymore and you're able to enjoy beautiful, beautiful things in the next life. Again, for me, it's heaven. Uh, but yes, your mother is having a lot of fun. I can, I can tell you that for sure. So thanks yeah, for sharing and, that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we are limited. We think we, we have a lot of experiences. Um, when I've talked to spirits, what I've gotten in EVP answers, ghost box answers, as well as just to, you know, mediumship is that um, sometimes spirits miss the physical and sometimes they can come back if they want. Some people believe they come back. I do believe that. But most of them, there's so much more. I mean, for example, they see everything. They can see through structures. Mm -hmm. They are, trans, they, you know, they, they can move through energy. Um, they can go anywhere in the universe they want. There's no linear time. They don't get old. So they can be anywhere they want, any dimension. Exactly. And, and they choose uh, sometimes to come back, as Carrie Ann said, and hang out with us because they love us. They want to make sure we're okay. 
And sometimes they want to help us, give us advice as they did in when they were alive. So if yes. you had a, a grandparent or a parent or a brother or sister that passed and, um, you know, you need some comfort, you know, they could come and talk to you. Yep. Good, good, Joe. Thank you. Good questions. Um, this is from Michael. He said, it's not really a question. He said that his friend has orbs and a manifestation of a young boy. And one day after a few months, he had a group of orbs and one approached him, stopped as to say goodbye. And that's sort of like what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Went together with the rest and they left. He never had another episode of anything. And Michael saying that he's not a believer, but his friend is 100% credible. Mm -hmm. And he just wants to say he wish he could have joined him in on this uh, on the discussion. So, you know, thank you for sharing that, Michael. And it's it's amazing when people have these experiences. So thank you for sharing that. So this from Marissa now, what is the difference between an apparition and a poltergeist? That's a very good question. And we had discussed that one of our other webinars, I talked about the 10 different types of ghosts. Poltergeist is one of the 10 different types of ghosts. It's not as common as one would think. Again, the movies make poltergeist as if that's what is an ongoing mm -hmm. occurrence in the world, and it really is not. Um, a poltergeist is not necessarily an apparition. A poltergeist is oftentimes not even seen at all. It's just a very disruptive entity. Um, could be something that's bad, um, but something that is uh, disruptive. So usually they don't appear as an apparition. If it's a poltergeist, they are more... Uh, spirits that are capable of doing physical things uh, in a home, you know, making doors open or yeah, things and, crashing, that type and, of thing. It's not, it's not an apparition. So no, and the, and the uh, poltergeists originally, if you look at some of the, the case studies, um, a lot of them were occurred when there were children present, children that were going through uh, puberty, you know, they're getting into that teenage uh, age where there was a lot of emotion, a lot of energy, a lot of um, hormonal changes. And so you'll see these kids in this room and then you'll see the stuff levitating and you know things flying around the room. So all those early cases use, usually revolved around young people. Um, and I, you know, as Carrie, I, my first experience in <laughs> 1980 was a poltergeist experience. I saw things manifesting in the room and it I actually chased me out of the apartment after two weeks and uh, the landlord gave me the rent back. So I guess there must've been something That's going right. on in that place, but I wasn't that young though. So uh, that in that, my case, I think there was just more of an entity that was in that apartment. Someone had been murdered in there, but uh, right, there was a right. lot of activity. Good question though. All right, this, this is an interesting one. I like this from Christine. Uh, do these spirits go somewhere like heaven when they're not hanging out with us as orbs? Life as an orb seems rather boring. I wouldn't <laughs> want to live like that after death. Well, again, they're not living as an orb. Um, you know, they're in heaven, but they're, again, their view of it and where they are is different from our view. We could only know and see what's in front of us, what's tangible. We see the trees and the sky. We don't know what they see from their point of view. So it doesn't mean that all of a sudden they're a person that forms themselves into this ball, because remember, they're a soul at this point. Right. So it's their soul that forms this energetic ball that represents them and their soul. You know, so Carrie it's uh, they're not just floating endlessly no. around in this state. They are doing whatever they feel like doing, basically. You know, Karen, I was just thinking, orbs um, could, they're primarily round. And I'm just thinking they could actually be little, you know, we talk about portals, opening a portal, uh -huh. you know, where there's like the opening to the, through the veil to the other side. They could be little mini portals. Like yeah. I was thinking of portals on That's a ship, one. you know, like the, yeah. the window, because everywhere it opens, there's spiritual energy coming through. So it's almost like the veil is this fabric and you have these little holes in the veil that pop in and pop right. out and close down. Exactly. So that could be what they really are. But as far as the question about the spirit world, think about this. You want to go to Mars or you want to go to California. You want to fly over the earth at 10,000 feet. You want to feel the energy of walking through a case, a, a library case, full bookcase full of books. 
You want to feel the, the atomic particles. You can do that when you're spirit. A lot of people, you know, they say, how do you know, how does the spirit know you want to do a reading? You want to talk to someone's grandfather. Well, as soon as you talk, talk about them, you summon them, they're here. They might be over in Africa somewhere on a safari following some guy riding an elephant. And then here they are, you're talking about them. Oh, uh, Carrie Ann and Joe are talking about me. I better get over there. I'll right, be, I'll, right. I'll join it's you. True. For the, yeah, and that's that very it. well could be. Physical... Yeah. It's the physical universe, but more in the physical universe is more of an energy matrix. So you have all the advantages of being in the physical universe, but you also have the energetic universe, the non-corporeal universe, mm -hmm. which is every place. And it's all at once and it's amazing. So. Okay, I wanna make sure we get to all these. We have a couple more questions, Joe. Uh, two from Marissa. Is there a feeling or a vibe you get that compels you to take a picture of, say, your yard at the exact moment yeah. when you do that, uh, catches the orbs you catch? You can speak to them. I've done this many times. Mm -hmm. um, in some of my backyard uh, pictures, there was a time where my husband had been traveling a lot and um, I felt very alone and he was in Europe and I wanted to feel protected and felt that my I was secure on my house. So I went out and I talked to them. I took a couple shots and nothing came up. And I said, I just want to know that, you know, I'm protected around my house when I'm in it alone. And within a couple of minutes, that's when I got the orb photographs. Um, so they can come up. Um, there is another place I don't want to reveal where it is because it's in the new book. We were at a historical place in, mm -hmm. in Setauket. And we were in an attic and uh, I, I knew that there were spirits up there. And so we waited and waited and we took pictures and nothing came. And I said, please, I said, this is for the sake of the book. Um, we want to sh show people that you are here with us and that you're okay with the story. And boom, we photographed a couple of series of uh, pictures within 30 seconds, I would say, and then gone, then nothing. So I have had luck with speaking to them and having them do that. To answer the second part of your question, are cell phones capable of capturing orbs? I have not gotten them on my cell phone. I have heard from people who have claimed they have gotten them on their cell phone. One misconception though, I wanna clear this up because people send me things like this all the time. If you take a picture with an iPhone, I don't know if it's the same with the droids, but if you take a picture of like, a sunset over the water and people say they send me a picture oh i got a green orb it's not an orb it's some kind of thing that happens it like actually lens, annoys lens, me because i don't like when it flare. appears yeah, yeah so and it appears a lot of times in iphones and people mm -hmm. uh, all the time send me pictures wanting to know if it's an orb and it's not unfortunately but um you could try it with an iphone but i find that uh or any cell phone. I, it's really with the camera with the flash is what really somehow attracts it. So, um, and oftentimes with cell phones, we don't have the flash on. So uh, then we have an anonymous person who said, wow, looks like Mars. So that must've been one of the uh, questions there. I mean, one of the pictures. This from Angela. Um, I hope this is the correct forum for this question. Can a spirit orb turn on the TV only snow on the screen and within seconds, minutes, turn it off. This has happened several times in the bedroom TV. It wakes me up. I check the wires, cable box, etc. Everything seems okay. The remote is on the cabinet. No one near it. Once it woke me up and heard a noise. When I investigated, I found a burst water pipe in the basement. Could it be a family member, a loved one trying to warn me of some event? It does not happen often, but enough to question it. Thank you. Joe, you want to take that one? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, we have countless examples of spirits giving us warnings and signs. Um, they definitely mess with energy. We've all had experiences. Carrie Ann, you had the experience of the light bulbs blowing out when yeah. you walked in the house after we had, you know, gotten together and, and did. I think was the investigation. Yes, at and country so, house. Yeah, at country house. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, they can easily mess with remotes. Um, and turn things on and off. Uh, I've had, I've witnessed those things. And as far as the warnings, yeah, um, they try to help. Uh, 
I remember I was uh, in Southern California and I was zooming along the freeway and going down, down this big hill, a 6% grade hill with my Jeep Wrangler. And um, my spirit guide, Melissa, um, I have a couple of spirit guides. Um, she said, Joe, how fast are you going? I looked at my speedometer, I was doing about 85. And she was like, kind of like you should slow down. So I, I slowed down really fast, not <coughs> slow, slow, fast, whatever. And I slowed down to about 60, 65. And right after I got back into the legal speed limit, I passed a radar on a camera gun on a, a police motorcycle. Yeah, he was waiting for me at the bottom of the hill. So they do that. They, they give us all kinds of warnings. Uh, so if you do get a sign from a spirit, um, if they're trying to get a message, trying to get your attention by turning something on or off, uh, you know, listen to it, follow up on it. Okay, great. Uh, this is from Marissa. She writes, uh, and this is a good question, interesting. Not to be morbid, but being in this line of work and seeing what you've seen through your research and investigations, do you feel better prepared for what happens in the afterlife? So let me start by this. Um, do I feel prepared? The best way, the best advice I could give to all of you as far as preparing yourself for the afterlife is to be a good person. That's the best advice I could give you is to be a compassionate person, a caring person, and to just try your best to do the right thing. That's your best ticket to getting to where you wanna go. And for me, like I said, it's heaven. But as far as what the work I have done, um, I wouldn't say it has prepared me for the process of death, but it has given me an amazing understanding that yes, life does exist beyond this one yes. and that our yeah. loved ones do not leave us when they pass. They stay with us on our life's journey and they're able to communicate with us. So in that aspect, I feel that yes, um, what I have done with my work, I had never planned on doing this type of work. My degree is actually in photography. And as I mentioned, and but I have a better understanding of um, how communication is possible and that this next world is a wonderful place. And um, the best thing for Joe and I have been able to share our experiences of what we've learned since 2005 um, on these things and to be able to help other people understand and not be afraid of death or the dying process for that matter. Yeah, and, and you know, we have so much communication through our ghost box recordings with people that have moved to the other side, as well as our own people we've lost in our families and passed on. And we've gotten signs that they're okay. So uh, in the case of my father, um, I had a reading done for me by a mutual friend. Um, we were actually on the, our radio show that episode. And um, he said, my father's doing fine. He's back to his vibrant 18 year old self before he went into World War Two, he's got no illness, no, no back injury from the war. And he said, he's doing great. He's happy. He's with all his relatives, all his brothers, sisters, and his father and everybody's just, they're probably out there playing poker yep. or canasta or something. So exactly. but yeah, it's, it's a change. Some people regret when they get yanked out of this world too quick, or they haven't, as Carrie Ann said, you regret things you should have done in life. Don't worry about it. The spirit world does not judge anybody. And we, you try to do the best you can, but we're not perfect. And don't beat yourself over the head right. on it. Very true. Um, Good advice. Good question. Um, and then we have an anonymous attendee that says ghost box show. So I think we could do that, right? Maybe in January. Yeah. Because we'll, yeah. uh, next month, we're only going to do one because of the Christmas holidays. So we are going to do uh, a whole episode on um, Country House. Carrie, so do we do, do we yeah do we have a date on that yet? Uh, no, we have to get the date. Okay, we have to have that discussion. Um, and uh, just three last questions. Uh, Jean says, when you get EVPs, do you hear the reply immediately or later when you review the tape? So we did do a whole uh, webinar on this as well. But in, in a nutshell, it depends on the types of EVPs. If it's a white noise EVP, just with a recorder we don't hear it until we play it back. 
uh, with a ghost box, which we, we had just mentioned, that's a live recording of uh, spirit voices and you can hear it live. And we, we use our recorders to record what we get, but we hear it in, in live time. I, I just wanna chime in on that one too, is uh, as a medium, um, and Carrie Ann also gets this too. Um, we all are, we are all intuitive, just imagine how much we wanna develop it. Um, often I will call out something, right, Karen, or you'll call out some feeling. And then when we play back the recorder later, we'll hear the spirit say, yes, they agree with our answer. Right. So, mm -hmm. so we get a lot of validation, which is like cool. But the, yeah, the ghost box recordings, the ghost yeah. box is real time live communication. So we often hear. And especially with this new book, you got to sign yeah, up gotta, for my, this, this for my newsletter and stuff. Because I mean, when that book comes out, you got to hear these, these. I mean, we have that one EVP. Funny. We can't say where it is, but we have that one ghost box recording. It's six minutes. I know. We, we have some, some yeah, it's, amazing things. So our last two questions of the night. Um, have you ever seen, this is anonymous attendee, have you ever seen other images inside orbs like the one a country house. Yes, definitely. For I had mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that I saw the orb behind my sister-in-law that had the face of a dog. And I have gotten other pictures at times of uh, faces. I just, I couldn't find everything. Um, and like I said, I was already giving Joe a lot of pictures to put into the presentation, but um, you can get faces and different things. And, and we have captured that. Mm -hmm. All right. And then the last question um, is in the chat room from Francis. Um, what about someone who committed suicide? Are they a touched spirit on the other side? You want, you want to take, take that, that one, Jim? Yeah. Are they a what spirit? A, a touched spirit on the other side. So could you chat? What does that mean, touched? Do you mean affected or negative? Yeah. Or So, yes. okay. All right. So when you pass through, <laughs> what happens is, you see, you have Akashic Records, which is a database of your whole life. It's basically like a, you know, like a historical archive of everything you've done. And when you pass through the veil and you actually, your, your body dies, um, you see everything you did in life. You get like a snapshot. You, you've heard the expression, people said, oh, I almost died. I had a near death experience. I saw my life flash before my eyes. That's really true. And so what happens is if you've had a, problems in your life, you do carry that baggage with you. So some people believe that the purgatory or hell, depending on how bad it is, is how much you have to reconcile that stuff before you can move forward after you pass. That's why when I do readings, a lot of times carry on, people come back to me like the spirits, like abusive parents, for example, might come back and want to make amends, want to apologize for treating their kids really badly when they were alive. So that there's a lot of grieving that goes on. A lot of people don't realize the spirits grieve too. So as far as if you had a suicide, you might regret it. I've had several suicide readings where the spirits said, you know, they were really bummed out that they, they killed themselves. They really thought that was stupid and they, they didn't mean to hurt everybody that they left behind. So yeah, it is sad, but um, the good and news is there's a lot of love on the other side that is ready to embrace you yes. and help you move. Because I just want to clarify something too, when you had talked about, uh, you know, with people with baggage that may have been abusive or that kind of thing, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that they're not where they're supposed to be in, in heaven. I mean, like right. Joe said, there are certain people that, you know, might go to purgatory for certain crimes or things or, that they but did, but no person, mm -hmm. right. No person is perfect. And that's why I say, just try to be the best person you can be. We're not perfect but um, you can make mistakes and that's fine. You're not gonna be held accountable but, for those. Right, but, you know. uh, and I, I wanna just add that again, purgatory or even hell doesn't mean that you're not gonna, and this is not a religious thing. I mean, you, you're not, it doesn't mean you're not gonna eventually get up to heaven or whatever you would consider heaven or the next dimension. Uh, it just means that you have to resolve that because you do see what you did all the, all the junk that you did to people, the hurt that you put on people. And that's painful. That is hell for a lot of spirits. And it might take them a, a couple of minutes, might take them 20 years, or 100 years for them to work that out. And they might linger around the physical saying, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm, and nobody's listening because he's that guy's dead and the family is moving on with their life and they're living. So yeah, um, 
you don't have to be perfect, but everyone will get there eventually. I really yes. do believe and, that. And their idea of time and hours is very different. So yeah. 50 years to us could be five minutes in their world yeah. kind of thing. So that's right. The, the time is erased from that. So at this point, I'd like to wrap it up. We went a little bit over, but you guys were a great crowd tonight with a lot of questions. I hope we answered them um, to the best of our abilities. Uh, like I said, we're not, I wouldn't say that we know, have the answers to everything. We just are giving the information that we have discovered and we leave it up to you whether or not, you know, you take that with you. But I wanna thank all of you for your support with the webinars. Um, if you wanna continue, uh, coming to these events that we will be doing, um, then make sure you go to my website. You could sign up for the monthly newsletter and that will also give you announcements for when these webinars are coming up. It'll also give you notification of when the book next year is coming out, when we have the book launch or the book review, which you'll be invited to and um, all of that. The other thing too, the holidays are coming. If anyone is interested in signed copies, um, I decided to put up a shopping cart uh, since I can't do in-person events on my website. And I currently have historic haunts of Long Island, historic crimes of Long Island, the metal and uh, the ghostly tales of Long Island, which is the middle grade uh, adaptation. So those are available um, for purchase. I'll ship them out to you and you could get them personalized and signed by me and I'm offering free shipping until the end of the year. So if you're interested in that, you could also go again, Carrie and Flanaganbrowski.com or ghostsofwildland.com. And we will be doing, like I said, one webinar next month um, about the country house and uh, we'll keep coming up with the next topics. Uh, Marissa, I know you said, when is the next webinar? Uh, we don't have a date yet. So like I said, the best thing to do is to at least get the newsletter or I also put things up on Facebook. You have to check, I do not have a friends page. Some people get confused that there's some page that's a friend page, but it's a fan page, you have to like it. So I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and Joe is also on Facebook. So, you know, we try to put it out there uh, as much as possible um, to let people know what webinars we're doing. So if you could check back, we just haven't, we've had a lot going on, so we haven't had a chance to figure out the date, but I would say it would probably be around the second week of December. Yeah, that's what know. I'm thinking, yeah. You mm -hmm. know, so, uh, but we'll, it'll be we'll 7.30, it'll be on a weeknight probably. Yeah, yeah, and they usually run about an hour, hour and a half top, so. I'll get to tell my story about our country house dinner that Annette came and crashed the party. That's right. That, that's right. I know we have lots of stories. We, we have lots we have of stories. Lots we'll keep you entertained yeah. all winter when we're all locked away, you know, from COVID. I'm glad, Marissa, you said these are great. I'm so glad I've been getting a lot of good feedback. Thank you, Thank so you, it's Joe Thank on these webinars. So uh, we appreciate the support because it's been hard for us to dealing with the situation and trying to figure out, you know, how to make things work. Um, is Joe available for a reading? <laughs> this is from Jean. Um, yeah, Jean. So, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Joe, if you want to give your website information, yeah, um, and we have a couple of thank yous here from Michael and some other people. So, yeah, thank, thank you, you all too for joining us tonight. We really appreciate sharing the information. Um, yeah, uh, go to my website, Joe G. Medium PI. Think of Magnum PI. Like it was the story to that, right? That the yeah. execution rocks the lighthouse. But um, Joe G. Medium PI dot com. And there's a request page there, or you can go to my Facebook page just to go to Joe, Joe Giaquinto. You can find me on Facebook um, and you can go to Carrie Ann's website. I think you have a link to mine. Yeah, we're all linked website. together. <laughs> we're all linked together. Go to Carrie Ann Flanagan Broski. Oh, you can, you can find, find Joe. Me, yeah. or, just or send you me a request and I'll send your information you. yes. and I'll contact you yeah. and we'll see okay. how we can help you. All right, everyone, we have to run. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, everybody. We'll Enjoy the rest of the week. Soon. All right, take care. Bye. Bye, everybody.